Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. Now we all take for granted our digital SLR camera these days, or we have done for quite a long time. But if you think back, just a lousy 15 years ago, what was technology like back then? Who was the major players? Could you get what we consider a modern digital SLR? Well, check it out. 15 years ago, this was state-of-the-art digital SLR technology. And no, it didn't come from Nikon or Canon, although it says Nikon on the top there, it actually is Kodak. Kodak ruled the roost back then. They ruled the entire digital SLR market. This is 1998 vintage. It is a DCS 315 model and this is pretty much the first digital SLR which you know wouldn't be out of place um, in terms of features and functionality in uh, you know today's market. We're talking um, five thousand dollars for this little puppy back in 1998 mere 15 years ago. Um, Nikon uh, top on it, it uses, used the Nikon uh, Pronia 6i SLR camera body, but it used a Kodak sensor and Kodak back and Kodak processing and essentially was um, pretty much a Kodak camera. So this predates both Canon and Nikon digital SLRs. Nikon didn't come out with their um, digital SLR, the D1, until 1999, a year later, which was all Nikon. And Canon didn't come out with their first one, the D30, until 2000. So this one predates those. Kodak ruled the market. But even one year from this to the Nikon and then another year to the uh, Canon digital SLRs, absolutely incredible. But this one was the first digital SLR on the market, basically, that had an LCD preview on the back. Wow. You know, you take that for granted these days, but back then, that was a huge deal. And it had JPEG processing built in. The first camera, LCD, JPEG processing. This sucker took uh, three images per 11 seconds. It took uh, two seconds to process and store a single image and it took a whopping 25 seconds to background process the JPEG image. And ah, slow as a wet week, but back then this was state of the art, $5,000. And it's not that long ago, 1998. It just goes to show the rapid progression in digital SLR technology, because even in the early 2000s, as I said, this thing was just old hat and clunky. It's just, you know, useless. Almost, it was out of date before it was even released, pretty much. But um, that is the march of technology in the digital camera market. So I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at, oh, and it had pop-up flash as well. Oh, big innovation. Use the standard uh, Nikon uh, F-mount um, lenses as well, because it was a standard Nikon body, APS, um, C, APS uh, size uh, sensor in it. So I thought we'd check out what technology was like inside this thing. I don't think it's going to be state of the art. Look at the size of it. Absolute beast. It used uh, uh, standard AA uh, rechargeable batteries in there and a PC card slot. There's actually two PC card slots in there. This one actually has, um, it came with a PC uh, card to compact flash adapter card, which uh, people would have used uh, uh, later to use compact flash cards in it. It's got Check this out. You won't get this in a modern camera. A firewire connector. Woohoo! It's all happening because they had to get the massive, like 600 kilobyte size JPEG images out of this thing as super fast as possible. So, an absolute relic in terms of digital cameras. But I thought it'd be interesting to take a look at the technology inside this thing and compare it, hopefully, in a future video to a uh, modern digital SLR. Oh yeah, retro electronics. Let's go see what's inside this puppy. And here it is up close. You can clearly see the uh, delineation between the Nikon uh, Pronia 6i camera body itself and the Kodak bottom with the uh, batteries and the uh, 
uh, compact flash and all the uh, processing down in there and of course the um, Kodak back on this thing as well so it was basically sort of like a, the Nikon optics and mount and uh, all that uh, sort of stuff and the external body appearance but everything else was basically uh, Kodak in this thing and um, yeah there's not much uh, to it so on the top we've got our shutter button here we've got a multi-function selector in fact there's two of them there's one on the front here as well we've got a uh, QR out button dedicated main on off button we've got a self timer button here and a basic and advanced mode and that's pretty much um, it for the top controllers of course uh, standard uh, hot shoe and then we've got our uh, viewfinder as well and on the back here we have our uh, dedicated auto exposure button and then menu select and record tag buttons for the tiny LCD and let me switch this sucker on although this camera is not actually uh, working the um, LCD down the bottom doesn't work but this main one up here does actually work check it out there it is Kodak Professional there's no images in memory but I can't uh, select anything nothing uh, seems to work if I press the shutter button it sort of uh, disables the LCD, but yeah, I can't really uh, do anything else with that uh, thing at all. Unfortunately, it's not working, but of course that uh, preview window, it, it wouldn't of course have a live output. That didn't come until a long, long time later, and uh, so it was only uh, used for the uh, image preview, of course. Don't know what the resolution of that is, but it's absolutely uh, tiny as you saw so you couldn't really get any decent detail on that but of course uh, your main camera uh, functions were on this um, lower much lower power LCD uh, which is still common today you get the lower power uh, LCD on the top so you don't have to waste battery driving the main screen at the back it's got um, a backlight button and various uh, modes and settings for all that sort of stuff and a busy LED because if you switch it on hey I'm busy for a second I gotta take time to power up so there you go and on the bottom we have a standard uh, tripod mount and check this out you don't see this anymore made in the USA by Eastman Kodak company can you believe it and then on the uh, front of this thing standard Nikon uh, mount of course then we've got uh, the autofocus and manual focus button and the release for the lens and that's uh, pretty much it. I mean, you know, nothing else fancy whatsoever. And of course, it is based on the uh, Pronia 6i body. An earlier model was based on the Pronia 600i model. And of course, you can recharge it on the side there and extract your photos super quick using that fire wire connector. Unbelievable. And sorry, it's not exactly easy to get a uh, good, perfect view for the, through this uh, viewfinder, but hopefully, you can see there the. Uh, field of view through the viewfinder, the actual optical view, is much larger than the image uh, sensor capture size uh, denoted by the thick black outer rectangle there. You can see the inner uh, markers and circles in there as well, but that's due to the mismatch between the uh, Kodak uh, sensor used and sort of, you know, bodged onto um, <laughs> one of the, you know, an existing Nikon uh, optical um, APS sensor SLR camera they weren't a complete perfect match and that's uh, something you take for granted these days of course that they're you know they're fully designed um, the sensors all match the uh, optical uh, parts of the body and you get that uh, full frame through the viewfinder and stuff like that but yeah look at the uh, huge amount of uh, wasted space through the viewfinder there and if you have a look at the battery uh, compartment on this, used uh, six either uh, standard double A's, although it does recommend alkaline batteries may degrade camera performance. Nickel metal hydride batteries are recommended. But uh, yeah, that's a rather uh, neat little pack to just uh, slide inside there. It's not terribly easy to get out. And you can see the um, two uh, PCMCIA uh, card slots in there, down in there. I mean, you know. Oh, jeez, those things are a blast from the past. They've gone the way of the dodo. Now, this SD card rubbish you get these days. And you can see uh, some of the optics down in there, the mirror and uh, reflecting up to the uh, top eyepiece, of course. I can't make the uh, mirror flip, unfortunately. It doesn't uh, work in that respect yet. Maybe when we, uh, well, at least electronically, I can probably manually flip it over once we take the thing apart. But all those optics and... Um, 
uh, stuff would have been uh, standard in the uh, Pronia 6i SLR film uh, camera, of course, and they're just, uh, in, in, and of course, instead of the uh, image actually reflecting onto film, it reflects onto the uh, Kodak sensor, which is uh, retrofitted or bodged into this thing. But what I can do is get in there and just manually flip up that mirror by hand there, and you can see that we've got ourselves a, we can't see the sensor, we've got ourselves a uh, shutter in front of the sensor in there. And if you're curious about the size, you know, there it is uh, compared to my hand. I don't have a necessarily uh, big hand, so it was, it was relatively uh, compact for its day, and it doesn't weigh a huge amount, even with the uh, battery pack. I mean, it's got no uh, lens on there, of course, that would have added uh, significant weight to it, but uh, it, it certainly would have been a very usable camera in its day. All right, let's take this thing apart and uh, see what we can see. I'd expect uh, lots of uh, flex, well, I'd expect uh, flex PCB technology surface mount. I believe it's got a power PC processor of uh, some description. We'll no doubt find out what the exact one is in a minute. And uh, so, yeah, as, as with all these cameras, yeah, I expect some flex PCB, maybe some... Uh, you know, standard, a big, uh, standard, uh, rigid PCB on the back. You know, lots of, um, sort of, not much uh, system integration, which you'd find these days. You know, you wouldn't get like a, you know, a, a Digic, you know, like a Canon Digic uh, uh, processor and, you know, incredible processing performance. It would be very, uh, very bare bones. And uh, there we go. The bottom is popping off. That is the bottom we can start awesome we can already start to see two board construction there one we've got a main board down the bottom so we've got our main rigid boards a standard 1.6 millimeter we've got a secondary board up there of course for the uh, pc uh, card slots with the battery above that it's got it's had a mod done to it mod 2 whatever that is i don't know but uh, looks like we've got um, a uh, programming or a test interface down here because of course that doesn't uh, made up with uh, anything externally so that would have been a uh, production uh, firmware download or a production test system or something like that so let's delve deeper and of course with such a large uh, case with large flat surface area like this I mean as a designer that's a, uh, a dream because you can make use of just you know a single large uh, flat PCB like that. I mean, but uh, today's um, more modern cameras, of course, are much more ergonomic and uh, compact and stuff like that. And they have to make extensive use of, uh, you know, rigid flex uh, PCB technology and stuff like that. But yeah, they can obviously get away. They've probably even got some slide rails on there or something for the board or standard mounting posts, you know. Not a huge um, big system integration issue from a PCB uh, design point of view and then we've got a third board up the top of course uh, for mounting the LCD on so, <laughs> dual um, flat flex cables there I'm not sure not exactly uh, sure why they need two of them they obviously didn't have enough connections coming over so is the uh, main driver on the main board down here and all the segment data for the LCD has to come via the uh, two ribbon cables perhaps These are large really large uh Phillips here holding in that main board. I mean, hey, look at that. We've got some Loctite on the screw there. So they've gone to a, a bit of trouble to ensure that that's uh, not going to come out. So hopefully I can pop this back plastic off and get access to the main board in there. Ah, I thought that was one large flat flex across there. Ah, it's not. So I think once we get those flat flexes off, we're pretty much... Uh, Going to be able to lever off this top body here, and now we're getting down into the guts of it. I can see lots of SMD goodness. Of course, it's going to be all SMD. Jeez, it's not that old. It's uh, 1998. So, uh, let me work on this. I got it. I got it. Just required a bit of percussive maintenance. And uh, got ourselves another flat flex. No, I was uh, not... There's no uh, 
rigid PCBs in here. We'll take a look at these boards uh, more up close. That's actually, uh, there's a lot of LCD uh, driving goodness on there, of course, so it wasn't uh, uh, driving the uh, signals directly over all this uh, flat flex here, but ta-da, we are in like Flynn. Look at that. And as I suspected, so far there is no appearance of any custom uh, ASICs or uh, system integration. It's all off-the-shelf technology. We've got our uh, cells, our Motorola processor down here, which we'll check out. We've got some uh, flash memory over here. We've got some uh, main system memory over here. We've got some IDT uh, devices. They were big back in the day. We'll check those out. But really, you know, um, uh, no big system integration, all built using off-the-shelf components so far. But we do have, uh, this is a double-sided load, of course, so we need to flip the board over. But um, it uh, wouldn't surprise me if we don't uh, see anything uh, of real note on the other side either. And there's our main processor, and yes, it is a Motorola PowerPC. It's actually the uh, the first embedded version of the PowerPC. It's the XPC821 series, and this is known as the uh, Power Quick, as in double uh, C Q U I double C Power Quick architecture and it had had uh, PCMCIA built in, worked up to 50 megahertz, had various other peripheral uh, functions built in as well. We can see a real-time clock crystal next to that, 32K uh, crystal there, and it did a hell of a lot and that is responsible for, I'm sure, all of the processing grunt in this thing. So it'll be interesting to see what's uh, tacked on the other side, but that would have uh, pretty much handled everything. I'm of course, it's uh, virtually obsolete these days, but uh, back then this was uh, pretty hot stuff. This was uh, the first integrated, um, embedded PowerPC processor. And the uh, PowerQuick line of uh, processors is uh, still going, though, but uh, I believe 8.2, the uh, 8.2.3 is the uh, latest version. I don't think the uh, 8.2.1 is a current part anymore. But, uh, yeah, they're still based on the same uh, PowerPC 603 core, so you can still get them, and they are highly integrated. And coupled to that, we have a uh, Intel flash memory 28F016. That's a, a 1 meg by 16-bit. Uh, flash that uh, most likely uh, contains all the system firmware for the Motorola processor. And coupled into the processor there, the main working uh, DRAM, one me two 1 meg by 16 part um, could be, and a couple of extra on the bottom side as well, we'll see. Check this out, we have ourselves a fair dinkum bodge board. It looks for all the world like that has been retrofitted, so that's maybe what the mod sticker was or something like that. I mean, it's right near the uh, power socket, so maybe um, they had some issue with the uh, uh, power on this thing. Um, you know, uh, uh, charging it, doing uh, doing whatever, so they've had to add on this extra bodge board. Unbelievable. Check it out. Somebody's blowing the ass out of this device. It's a regulator or a transistor or something like that on this mod board. And that's just had the magic smoke released from it. So it's not going to work anymore. Um, I don't believe this is uh, why the thing's not working. I mean, clearly the uh, main process is working well enough to, you know, boot up and run and drive the menu and the LCD and everything else. So obviously it's just part of the input, um, DC input uh, jack. So the battery uh, system Seems to be working fine, but yeah, oopsie. And of course we have ourselves a date code here, 49th week 98. So this was manufactured uh, probably in early 99 or thereabouts. If we have a look down in the bottom side of the board here, we've got ourselves a uh, IDT70V06. That's actually a 16K by 8 dual port uh, SRAM. So they're obviously doing some fast uh, buffering inside this thing. I mean, it's not fast, like it's not large enough at uh, 16K by 8 to uh, store like a full image or something like that, but they could be um, uh, storing uh, stuff from the image sensor and coupled into that is a uh, Lattice Semiconductor Mark IV uh, CPLD, uh, obsolete now, but it's the LV64-32. So they've got some custom logic in there looks like maybe uh, coupled into the um, uh, dual port SRAM there. So, and they, uh, coincidentally, right near these connectors, and we'll see where they go to in a minute, likely down to the sensor somewhere. And then we have another IDT um, dual port SRAM here, but this one's only a tiny 512 uh, 
by nine uh, bits, so absolutely uh, tiny, but that seems to be sort of bridge in between the larger dual port RAM over here and the uh, flash um, interface, uh, sorry, the DRAM interface to the uh, microcontroller. And down on this side, looky what we have here stuck under the firewire connector by a bit of tape. If we can get that out, it looks like we have all of our um, flash uh, circuitry for the uh, pop-up flash, not flash memory, for our uh, pop-up flash down this side of the unit. And we've got ourselves a bigger ass uh, 1 ohm power resistor under some uh, heat shrink there that was tucked under that firewire connector, and that all seems rather sort of all uh, bodged together compared to the uh, design of the rest of it, which is really is uh, quite neat. So it almost uh, seems like it was uh, tacked in there as an afterthought. Whether or not this is uh, a Kodak thing or part of the original, uh, could be a part of the original Nikon uh, camera body and all that. And here's what it looks like when we flip out this board. It's got a big ass uh, board to board inner connector connecting down to the uh, PC card uh, slot down there. As you can see, yeah, we do have some extra uh, DRAM on the bottom as I suspected. Looks like we've got a big regulator, but apart from that, just a whole bunch of uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, passive bypass stuff and other miscellaneous, um, you know, basic, you know, some SO14s and uh, stuff on the back of this uh, main board here. We've got ourselves a, a battery backup by the looks of it, or is, yeah, that's a battery backup, backup not a uh, super cap. So that's soldered directly onto the board. There's our LCD um, interface, our color LCD uh, interface for the main uh, preview um, LCD, which then pops up through those uh, flex uh, cables there. And, uh, and we can see, of course, the uh, secondary board down in here, which we'll uh, take out. That's got the uh, firewire connector on the side here, plus the uh, PCMCA. Uh, dual slots on the top here, hence <clears throat> why they need a, a big ass board to board interconnect here. And then, ta da, there is our sensor board. You can <clears throat> see straight away that uh, it looks like our sensor is soldered, uh, is uh, on the other side. Well, there it is, you can see the body. I think you can see the, see the back body of the, well, there's a metal frame in there, uh, heat sink probably acting as a heatsink and a rigid uh, mount for the um, image sensor, which is going to be behind here like this, an analog devices part, which we'll take a closer look at. But yeah, that's, so I was right, that was the data coming directly out from the sensor there. In fact, that is just going to, oh, lift out. There's our shutter. Ta-da! There it is. And if we turn it over, we're going to get our first look at sensor porn. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. And check it out. This is hilarious. It literally is a Nikon um, film SLR. Look, body. Look, you can see the original moldings in here where the film would have, uh, the roll of film would have gone into there. Look at that. That's, you know, it's, it serves no other purpose. It's clearly the original uh, camera body. So if you took apart that um, Nikon, uh, that model Nikon camera, the uh, 6i, then um, yeah, we <laughs> did film in here, goes across the back, and it'd have a different backing uh, plate on it, of course, and it'd have the electronics to uh, uh, drive all that uh, stuff, of course, but yeah, there you go. So it, you can see how it is, bodge technology, hybrid technology, between when they, you know, they uh, sort of couldn't go into the full resources of uh, designing a complete digital camera from scratch, it'd take them too long to get uh, to market, so they just teamed up with Nikon, Nikon and also they had uh, Canon variants that used uh, uh, hybrid uh, Canon cameras as well. There's various uh, models. This is the uh, 300 uh, series, but there were 200 and 400 model series and all that sort of thing, which used uh, all variations of various Nikon and or uh, Canon cameras. But you can see how it's just bodged in there. Well, you know, it got the job done. And of course, here is what everyone wants to see, the sensor board. And there it is. It's a, uh, you know, classic uh, ceramic uh, dip uh, package there. And of course, just uh, soldered directly into the back there as a dip package right along there. They've got some alternate uh, pads on there, whether they're, whether they're for an alternate uh, sensor, because um, it, it might be the case, actually, because this model 
um, is the 315. There also is the uh, 330, which was a 3 megapixel uh, version of this camera. And uh, so, you know, it, clearly it would use a different sensor. So maybe that's what's going on there. They might uh, have a different uh, bracket for that. This is uh, clearly obviously used for uh, heat sinking of this puppy. Would have probably got a uh, little bit warm, I suspect. And it also, I don't know if it helps with the rigid uh, mounting of it anyway. It does allow uh, sealing. So they've uh, clearly sealed around here as well. And if you take a look at the uh, camera, body itself you can see all the gunk sealed around the uh, uh, shutter system in there. So it looks like they have uh, possibly shared that board between the two models there uh, but that remains to be seen. We'd have to do a uh, tear down of the uh, 330 to actually uh, see it. If anyone's got any uh, photos of that then uh, please let us know. We'll take a look at uh, some of the devices but there's not much um, on here at all. That's probably the ADC that will uh, take a look at. On the top side here we've just got some uh, LT parts and some passives. So these linear technology parts down here, 1175 and the uh, 1129, they're just uh, low dropout linear regulators and really nothing else. And on the top side here, yes this is the ADC but it's more than that. It is a uh, complete CCD signal processor. It's the analog devices AD9801. Uh, obsolete uh, part now. The data sheet for this thing will be uh, linked down below as will most of the uh, data sheets um, for uh, you know items used in this uh, teardown. So if you want to check out the uh, data, check it out. But this is a specific 10-bit uh, 18 meg sample um, ADC specifically designed to interface to CCD sensors. Wow, what do we got here? A CCD sensor. And there is our CCD sensor. Check it out in that uh, ceramic dip package. And uh, that is quite a work of art. Once again, a whopping 1.5 megapixels. Oh, state of the art at the time. Yes, the upgraded model had 3 megapixels. And I think possibly if you watch this in HD, you might be able to see the individual pixels in there because there's not a huge amount of them. Um, and this is at, uh, using my x10 macro lens. And there's another view down there. I could get out my uh, uh, main microscope, which does you know a couple of hundred uh, times, but I might leave that for a second video. And near that we have a Maxim Max 533 8-bit quad DAC. So basically a DAC and an ADC on this board, plus we've got one other chip directly under the sensor. And that looks like a Texas Instruments part. It's, uh, it's got 7AASX2J and then PSN104564 on it. And I can't find any data on that at all. And it's most likely just some sort of uh, driver slash uh, level uh, translator for the uh, CCD sensor. So yeah, there's nothing else really of uh, note on the back of this board. You know, 74HC259 and some couple of, a couple of linear uh, stuff around here. Regulator, some more memory. Uh, as we noted, bypass caps on the uh, BGA main uh, power PC. Uh, processor up there, a couple of um, more HC, 74HC series logic and not much else. And check it out, there's actually a uh, jumper there isolating the positive side of the battery there. Um, looks like we've got a bit of uh, uh, oxidization happening on that uh, positive pin but yeah look it, and look at the red gunk behind that, it looks like it's been glued down after it's been installed. So my first glance uh, thought was right, the main PowerPC Motorola processor is controlling everything. It's controlling the large, uh, well, large for the time, uh, graphic um, color LCD here, because look, there's no drivers on the back of that. Of course, you know, it's coming uh, directly in, and uh, it's, you know, there's no other image uh, processing custom ASICs or anything on this at all. So that's why this clunker is uh, so, so slow. It's got to do the uh, background JPEG uh, processing. It's going to be running a real-time operating uh, system, of course, some sort of RTOS so that it, uh, you know, it can be doing all that background background processing and handle the uh, front panel interface and to the two LCDs and, uh, you know, and um, capturing all the image data and uh, processing it, handling all the uh, uh, memory PCMCA, memory card interface, I believe that's uh, built in, and it handles everything. 
Now, the PCMCIA adapter board uh, looks like it's got uh, nothing on it. Uh, essentially, it looks like it goes directly from the socket, um, essentially through to the, uh, the main socket, through this board-to-board -board connector to the processor. But I can see some stuff down underneath the socket there, so I'm not sure how I can get that out with uh, out desoldering everything. Anyway, it's not going to be that terribly uh, interesting anyway, I don't think. And, of course, for the uh, Firewire... Um, interface has its own uh, dedicated chip as well. The uh, uh, main um, processor isn't going to be able to handle that uh, direct. So that's a Texas Instruments TB11LV01. We've got ourselves some uh, copper shielding tape down here under the main board. So they've obviously done that for uh, EMI reasons. And there's our inverter board for the uh, flash. And there's our main storage cap down right down in there huge thing I can't work out the value it's got something zero microfarads and that down in there is the jack for the remote shutter release which is on the top side of the camera there and as for the rear panel uh, LCD board here we've got a Hitachi uh, H8 300 series family here now uh, Renesis of course uh, they um, took over from Hitachi in that respect and just some uh, interface uh, chips here which drives all the uh, segments on the other side for the LCD. Now this is rather interesting. They're using sort of uh, these three screws here with these uh, retaining clips to somehow sort of, uh, you know, join these flat flex cables together. So it looks like, you know, these come in like this and then join up to this flat flex which then like a, you know, some sort of press contact thing under there you can see the circular contacts around there that then it goes up to the top there which uh, you know presumably goes up to all the uh, top uh, switches and stuff like that so there's nothing fancy um, going on up in the top here so I don't actually expect to find any more uh, significant circuitry inside the uh, top of the camera up here anyway it's all pretty much done and dusted and here we go I've taken the screws off there and you can see the contacts on those flat flexes there. Look at that. And they're just all a press fit down together. That is an incredibly complicated arrangement. I don't see, I think I've seen a flat flex arrangement that complicated before. Check out the levels on that. There's no less than three flat flexes going over to there with all these contacts, top and bottom, like that. And then that sandwiches in like that with these two flat flexes with contacts top and bottom and that all goes into there like that and sort of it screws in place and, and holds it down. Unbelievable! Here's the original Nikon uh, Pronia 6i body going around there of course it'd have a different uh, back on it if it was actually sold and manufactured as the Pronia 6i film SLR uh, camera. You can see how Kodak have just taken the actual, you know, the actual production body itself, taken off the back panel, they've, you know, designed all these custom mouldings and attachments to actually go into this thing. So they've, you know, just gone to Nikon, look, give us all your CAD files and uh, we'll figure out the rest. And they went, yeah, no worries, just pay us whatever uh, royalty. And uh, then, you know, Kodak have just designed all of this um, add-on stuff to literally go around the existing body so it really is a true hybrid sort of approach and they've designed this uh, top part of the uh, grip here as well which then integrates so you know that's why you get the two different uh, types of uh, plastic here because they've um, you know come from different uh, design firms and by the way um, you would have maybe noticed the uh, Canon uh, viewfinder eyepiece up here on a Nikon body on a Kodak essentially a Kodak digital camera. So, meh, unbelievable. I'm not sure if that's like an aftermarket uh, one or whether or not it actually came originally fitted with that Canon eyepiece, but geez, you know, I mean, can you imagine anything with, you know, co-branded uh, Nikon and Canon with anyone else these days? It just doesn't happen. They, uh, uh, you know, fiercely uh, design and produce their own cameras, but this what was done back in the day. Kodak were the world leaders for about uh, 10 years before this in digital camera uh, digital camera technology uh, although this was the first one that actually had an LCD 
on the uh, back uh, JPEG processing and uh, you know, so it was innovative in that respect, and Canon and Nikon just hadn't caught up. They didn't have the technology then, but uh, as I said, then the first whole, uh, wholly designed and manufactured Nikon uh, digital SLR camera only came out a year after this one. So they were clearly, uh, you know, working on it. They knew the market was going to be there, but uh, back in the day, Kodak owned and drove everything because they had the digital processing technology. See, there's a lot of uh, wasted space in this camera. You may not be able to see it, but there's, you know, there's absolutely nothing down in there. I mean, the battery pack, you know, slides in, and it only comes down to, let me actually slide that in and show you where it comes from. So it clips in there, and there's a whole bunch of dead space. So they've actually just designed that grip there, and they haven't integrated any electronics, you know, in there at all. They've just gone for... You know, really uh, simplistic uh, bareboard design because they, you know, ergonomics, um, you know, not a huge, well, ergonomics were a big deal because they designed the grip so that you could hold on to it like that. But, uh, you know, they certainly um, didn't try and stuff any extra electronics in there. It was just too hard from a PCB and system design point of view when you've got all that gorgeous uh, space from a, you know, a PCB designer. If they came to me and said, oh, look at all this you know, you've got a huge big flat space up there to build your board. Oh, luxury. And of course, we've got the other part of our uh, film holder over here. There's a big empty uh, cylinder down in there, all just doing nothing in this camera. But of course, it would have served a uh, purpose along with uh, here for the Pronia 6i, which of course the film would have, uh, you know, you plug your film in there. And you, for those who remember film cameras, you wind the film over there and put it in there and it winds on the other part of it as you progress it and well you know I mean they've obviously stripped out a lot of other stuff as well there's lots of moldings in here for example which would have had uh, you know motors and various other uh, things and there would have been electronics uh, packed into the front of this thing in the Pronia 6i it might actually be interesting if we could somehow get a Pronia 6i film camera and take it apart and actually compare it and see uh, what they've actually uh, done compared to this um, uh, Kodak, but Kodak have obviously ripped everything out. We don't need anything. All we need is your shutter system and your uh, prism in there, your you know viewfinder and that's and your body and that's you know and your camera mount and that's a uh, lens mount. Sorry, and that's pretty much it. We'll do the rest. Thank you very much. So that's all she wrote on a barely 15 year old Kodak Professional DCS 315 camera. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, retro teardown and is a, um, a fascinating uh, you know under the hood look at digital SLR technology just before it hit the mainstream I mean this was essentially the first uh, affordable at five thousand dollars and uh, usable consumer digital SLR camera and uh, it was you know a hybrid based on some old you know cobbled together based on uh, Kodak's digital imaging technology which they've been developing for quite some time before this and a uh, traditional Nikon film camera for the mounts and, and the optics and everything else and well there you go it done it did the job uh, back in the day but within a year it was uh, surpassed by uh, Nikon with their first digital uh, SLR camera completely in house it's a more modern uh, more compact one without all the large um, you know uh, battery and storage down the bottom it's a it's you know a bit more compact and then uh, Canon after that with their first digital SLR just a year after that and bang then the market was just gone and Kodak were you know practically uh, out of business after that in terms of the digital SLR market which they totally pioneered and um, I will link in down below a very interesting history of and there's a PDF document interesting history of the development of the Kodak uh, digital camera system or DCS uh, camera system goes through all the models and all the developments right back to the 70s and I highly recommend you uh, have a look at that link down below it's some interesting history and uh, by the way if you've got any more um, info on uh, all this stuff uh, as always uh, please post it in the comments or jump on over to the EEV log forum if you want to discuss it all and if you like Teardown Tuesday you know what to do catch you next time